Eurasia is the largest continent of our planet. These boundless steppes and mighty mountains became the cradle of the Turkic world thousands of years ago. I am Samat Tolukbay, a journalist and researcher. I follow in the footsteps of our ancestors, in the footsteps of the Turkic tribes and people who engendered a great nomadic civilization, who left our steps and lived in different parts of the world. The school of nomads studying the past, creating the present to build the future. My journey through ancient Kazan continues. And today, I want to devote this episode to applied art. Indeed, there are legends about Tatar artisans, Turkic tribes that lived on the banks of the beautiful Volga from ancient time, passed on their crafts from generation to generation. In the very center of Kazan, the Tugan Avlum Ethnographic Center is located. Here everyone can personally get to know the culture, traditions, and life of the Tatar people. The complex consists of wooden huts, the feeling that I am in real Tatar village. And this is a monument to the main Tatar dish, Uchpuchmak. What a huge one! An artificial pond is a beautiful place in the ethnic village. Guests throw coins and make wishes. I also decided not to change the traditions. I hope it will come true. The main building of the complex is called Mill. Here craftsmen sit. So I should come here. Hello. Good afternoon. I am Samat, journalist and traveler from Kazakhstan. I came to this wonderful place to learn about the culture, traditions, and life of the Tatar people. Please show me your mill and who lives here. Of course. And what is here? Well, very nice to see you here. You are now in Tugan Avlam. Translated from Tatar, it is a native village. And here, now you are on the first floor of the large project. Mill in the Tatar language is Tegirman. We have four floors, and on the ground floor, we have historical costumes. Let me show you. Or maybe you get dressed. Try on a costume historically. I will be happy. I will only be glad. Of course, it seems that I will stay here for a whole day. Would you mind? Good, let's do it. I think we'll finish on time. So now, I will learn about the Tatar national clothes. Let's start. Isamuses. Hello again. I want to show you one of the costumes of the Kazan Kanade. This is a Khan costume. This is how the Khan looked like in the 15-16 centuries, according to our white stone Kremlin. You see what a fringe of fur, a rich beautiful dressing gown and a brocade shirt. But without a hat, of course, this costume is not complete. Here is a Khan's hat. It was framed with fur, semi-precious, precious metals, semi-precious, precious stones, and showed the power, wealth, and status of the owner of this headdress. And what kind of fur? This is our silver fox. In general, they were a beaver, a marten, and a sable. That is, these are the first that the Turks of the Kipcha group had which apparently were more frequent and hunters brought just such furs. Well, these furs were traded. The Tatars had two types of male chapan. They were called Zhilen and Chikmen. Most often such clothes were made from brocade or embroidered with gold. And this is the outfit of the Tatar queen. Her name was Hanbek. Without fail, the dress of ebony should have been light colors. This is called hasid, a band or shoulder girdle, weighed 15-16 kilograms. It was gold, silver, turquoise, 
various gifts from husband and parents, who had gathered since the birth of the girl. That is, we had it in this way. They were Hasid, Joe of the 20s, the 20th century. Kazan Tatars were very rich, and like all the girls, they loved gifts. But her headdress is not like any other. Here's a look at what a beautiful hat. The girl ran, she moved, and it was so beautiful. And in reality, everything was also framed by semi-precious and precious stones and metals. This is a costume of Kazan Tatars in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. See what an interesting decoration. This is called Izu. Izum raisins. Izu. Izu. Ah, Izu. Izu. This is a bib. Various decorations were attached here. Here was embroidery with gold, beads, pearls. That is all the beauties and riches could be fixed. And this is raisin. Each Tatar women's outfit has its own headgear. Some of them are so tiny that they look more like baby headdress. Each type of headgear has its own name. Tobite, Kuali Push, Kalfak, Borek. Some of them are similar to our Kazakh skull cups. And this is the clothes of the Tatar warrior. In the original, it was made of metal and leather. The Ethna Center presents a version made of durable fabric. The National Clothing Museum impressed me. It was as if I had visited the chambers of the Tatar Khans. But it's time to go further on the floors of this amazing building. I am sure no more interesting acquaintances await me. History, traditions, the culture of any people from ancient times passed in oral form. And this is called oral folk creativity. Similarly, from time immemorial, crafts have passed from father to son, from mother to daughter. In the ethnocultural center of Tugan Avlam, Tatar masters are happy to teach the younger generation their crafts. So the children's voices and laughter are heard everywhere. Endless school trips made me very happy. I, like these children, will attend several master classes here today. Next to me is Uncle Albert. He's a master of weaving. I'm very pleased to meet you. Tell me about your craft. Welcome, my dear guest from Kazakhstan. I am also pleased to meet you. Thanks. I weave various objects from willow branches. All of the willow branches. Yes, I myself grew up cradling this material. In our villages, there are a lot of different household utensils. Weaved it from willow branches and chests and cradles. This is for fishermen. With the help of this, you are fishing. Yes. I've been weaving since I was five. Now I have my students. Children from city schools come to our ethnocultural center. Someone is learning how to weave. Someone likes to work with clay. And someone draws. I am very glad that I can pass on my craft to future generations. We weave from such branches. Why willow branches? Are they stronger? Yes, these are twigs of a one-year-old willow. Willow grows like this. You can weave products from peeled rods, or you can directly with the bark. We are sure to boil the branches, remove the top layer from them and dry. And immediately, before weaving, the rods should be soaked in water. Now I'll show you. You probably haven't seen this before. Is this a trap? No. 
These are shoes that would walk in the snow. You put it on and you don't slip. What an interesting device. Wicker snowmobiles. In them, do not fall into the snow and do not slip. That's right. Imagine Master Albert has long exceeded 80 years. It's hard to believe, because the artisan looks good. This kind person turned out to be not only a talented master, but also an interesting storyteller. He showed me his works. Also told that in his youth, he was fond of mountaineering and was in our Kazakhstan mountains. Loop weaving is the craft of making wicker products from wines, household utensils and containers for various purposes, such as boxes, baskets, vases and even furniture. Under the wine is meant any natural material of plant origin, capable of easily bending with a certain processing and in normal conditions to keep in shape. The name of the material, vine, comes from the vine from which weaved baskets. Often the material for weaving is the willow twig. As you can see, the technique of weaving from the wine can be very diverse. These branches were cut three days ago. They did not have time to dry. So we make a hole and now I will show how to weave. This will be the bottom of the basket. Clear. Yes, we'll thread a twig in the center. You will learn and you will remember me that I taught you this craft. Make sure. Everything must be remembered well. Maybe you someday will become a master. Of course, I'll retire, I will weave all kinds of crafts to my grandchildren. Correct. So fix it. In Russian, this is called the basket. Do you know what English is called? Basket. Basket. You know the game of basketball. So initially, there too, wicker baskets were used. That's what they called it. Uh, that weave, crank and weave in in one direction. Uh. Let me show you, and you continue. If you learn the system, then the work is not difficult in principle. The flexibility of the material is important here. The branches should bend well and not break. The first row is fixing, therefore weave it denser. It seems to be. While I was weaving, Uncle Albert showed me his work. Uh, Once you're warriors, just like our war helmets. Uh -huh. Of course, not from branches. This is just a souvenir. Mm. Well, try on. You look like the real warrior. And this is a mace. Have you had such? This is a kalkan, a shield. We also call kalkan. Mm -hmm. And this is shumkar. And we have a shock bar, similar. I really like to communicate with the forerunners of Turkic ethnic groups. We each speak our own way. While we all understand, we find common similar words. And this makes me happy to know that, in fact, we all have the same historical roots. I would still chat with Uncle Albert, but other talented masters of the Ethnic Center are waiting for me.
Next to me is the charming Güzel Hanım. She is also a craftswoman of this center. Tell us about your craft. I do clay modeling. I make all kinds of dishes and children's toys, sculpt various animals, a lot of clay souvenirs. Hmm. I use local clay. This material is natural, environmentally friendly. Therefore, when sculpting, I try to put all the warmth of my hands, love and harmony into the product. And then anything will turn out beautiful. The main thing is to work with a positive attitude. What are we going to do now? From clay, you can sculpt anything. It all depends on your desire. But most often, guests prefer to sculpt a Kazan cat. Because when they learn its story, they immediately fall in love with this character. It is a symbol of our city. With pleasure. In 1746, when Elizabeth Petrovna ascended the throne, she found out that the Tsar barns and the Winter Palace were full of mice. Our Tatars served for the Tsarina, who said that there weren't any mice in Kazan, because Kazan cats are excellent mouse cutters. Upon learning of this, Elizaveta Petrovna ordered to immediately bring a whole batch of our cats to the palace. To Petersburg. They say that they brought a cat nicknamed Alabris. Ah. It turns out he showed such results that another 30 cats were sent after for St. Petersburg. And after that, the mice disappeared both in the Winter Palace and in the Hermitage. They say that even today the descendants of those same Kazan cats serve in the Hermitage. Really a very interesting story. Even I wanted to have a cat. That's why I'm making for myself from the clay a pretty Kazan cat. First, you need to dampen your hands in water and roll a clay ball. Now this is how it is. The main thing is not to rush. Roll up the sausage. And divide it into three parts. Uh -huh. Take one piece and roll the ball. This will be the head of our cat. I feel like a schoolboy at a labor lesson. I like it. My hands are working, my head is resting. So the ears. Then you need to rivet the paws. And now my piece of clay becomes like a cat. When finished, you should leave the figure for a day to dry. After it, it will be decorated and a beautiful Kazan cat will turn out. Now I'm going to get acquainted with another doubling craft. This is Uber. This is an oriental art with deep roots. However, the first time I hear about it, I'm very interested. Please tell me what kind of craft it is. Ibru is a very stranded kind of craft. It is the decoration of the fabric that came to us from the east. One opinion, where it originated, who was the ancestor in fact, 
it is absolutely known that the Ottoman Empire, its artists, picked up and greatly strengthened and developed it. Therefore, to this day in Istanbul, there are a lot of every workshops. Mm. Their craftsmen draw and support the tradition. These are organic mineral pigments mixed with bile, with water in certain proportions. Each master has his own secrets of how this is done, and they draw. Of course, today we paint with ready-made paints based on acrylic because it would be faster and more understandable. In the 16th-17th century, this art came to Europe and it was called Turkish paper. It was used in the printing industry in order to formalize bookends. And in Hermitage, there are such patterns. And we draw with our guests, too. You know that among us, among the Tatars, floral ornament prevails. And accordingly, we draw our tulip. Because the tulip symbolizes the culture of the Tatars. And the coat of arms of Tatarstan is eternal. Now we'll do the background. With such drops, patterns appear on the surface. Drawing on water is like meditation. Amazing art. The applied, colorful drops on the surface of the water blur. And now, with the help of special needles, you can display a variety of ornaments. Just turn on the imagination. Of course, this is not a drawing on paper. But to the wholesale, one requires extreme accuracy. Ibru from Persian translates as air clouds. And looking at these water drawings, I understand the meaning of the name. I also tried to draw a tulip. It turned out, of course, peculiar. But I really liked it. Yes, and the peculiarity of the Ibru is that no drawing will be similar to another. Next to me is Ilya. The master is a tanner who makes amulets. There are a lot of different symbols. There are animals and birds. But I like the golden eagle, the wolf and the horse. Because the wolf is a totem animal. We also have a special relationship with the horse. But the golden eagle is an important symbol. It decorates our flag. Therefore, please teach me how to make an amulet with the image of one of them. How do you do that? The technique that we use is called the skin cold stamping technique. In the Middle Ages, this was very common for the rich. Only rich people could afford to do this. They made various bags, belts, decorated saddles and used these stamps. They were made of either bone or wood. Mm. Then they punched with a hammer, made embossing on the skin. And such a pattern was obtained. In those days, metal was very expensive. Not all craftsmen could afford stamps from them. Since tanners were not a very rich people, unlike those who work in iron and steel. Nowadays, let's let us allow such metal stamps. Mm. So we chose the golden eagle. Yes, with an eagle. We take here such a stand. First, you need to moisten our workpiece with water. There is nothing to heat. We knock on wet skin, huh? No, this is a cold stamping technique. We wet our part. Take a hammer. 
Set our workpiece exactly in the center. Наши заготовки. And with a few strong blows of the hammer, we do our embossing. For me, this work was easier than ever. I think everyone can handle it. After drawing, it is necessary to paint the amulet and leave to dry. Ilya made an amulet with a golden eagle. Now I'll do the same, only with a wolf. I spent a great time with masters of the Ethna Center. I go on to discover the traditions and life of the Tatar people. And I ended up in a real tea house. I thought that there is no such people on earth who would love to drink tea more than Kazakhs. But these are the Tatars. There are several varieties of very different tea and a huge table. So the tea ceremony is a separate topic for conversation. Tell me about it. What is Tatar tea? This is not herbs. It is not just black tea. The most important aspects of Tatar tea are just two. It must be very hot and very strong. Today there are more than 125 types of herbs in Tatar tea, of which 17 to 18 species grow in our tea. Everything else is broad grass from the Caucasus, Altai, neighboring countries. Grasses are not only the meadows of Tatarstan, but also from the Mari lands, Bashkortistan, grass from the Urals and Izhevsk. Tatar tea, it's not just Tatar herbs, it's the ritual of its use. Now we'll drink tea. Let's start with the classic Tatar recipe. Here we have black tea, came directly from China, oregano, rose hips, a little lemon balm. These herbs are collected from the meadows of Tatarstan. Black tea came to us from the province where the first tea came to Tatarstan in the 17th century. As for the tea party, it is very simple. You should not lift the cup. Pay attention. I didn't add one and a half centimeters to the edge. With this gesture, as well as in the East, Tatarstan shows the owner's respect for the guest. So I respect you. But in addition to respect, there is also an ancient Tatar legend, which says that the aroma and soul of tea live in these one and a half centimeters. Try an experiment. Pour a drink in two identical bowls, just black tea without herbs where it will be poured to the brim. There the aroma will disappear immediately, because the temperature of the hot drink and rooms are very different, and the aroma with steam disappears. If we put one and a half centimeters above us, a layer of hot air forms and the aroma remains. Now bring the bowl, wave your hand, and the aroma is very strong. In Tatarstan, we hold the cup in our right hand or with two hands. Two options for Tatar tea drinking. Great aroma. Very tasty. At the hospitable table, the owner of the tea house told me many different stories about the peculiarities of Tatar tea drinking. I also tried traditional sweets. By the way, the Tatars drink tea, biting the sugar. This is delicious. During tea drinking, I did not notice how it got dark. Yes, the day in Tugan Avlam was busy and interesting for me. Leaving the gate, I saw a real fairy tale palace sparkling with multicolored lights. It turned out to be a local puppet theater. I think I know where I'll go tomorrow. So see you soon in beautiful Kazan.